started. All right. Does it, is it started? Okay. So, welcome everyone. I am going to give you a quick little backstory of this session. Um, and I did this in Toledo earlier this year and uh, it went over quite well. But the backstory is last year at Southwest Fox, I was having a casual conversation with a few people who were either speakers or had been speakers in the past. And we were talking about presenting and how do you become better at it and how do you learn and and so I kind of shared some of my tips with them just a few of them and we kind of went back and forth and I, I started to think wow that's that's really a good idea for a session is a session on how to do sessions so um, I put this together and in that course of the conversation with those people a comment was made about Doug constantly being Speaker of the Year at Southwest Fox, and this particular person really wanted to win the award away from Doug. So I have subtitled this presentation, How to Earn the Southwest Fox Speaker of the Year Award. So um, the session I put it together, and I want to stress, this is not all me. These are not my super wonderful tips. I am not all of that. This is what I've gleaned over the years from everybody else. I've learned so much from watching other speakers and having other people share tips. And that's what I'm trying to do here is just compile all the different things I've put together. Um, and in the end, we can talk when Doug opens up the, the sound to it. We can talk if other people have more tricks or tips or points definitely let's share them so that we can all be better speakers because that's kind of the goal here is we want Southwest Fox to be an awesome conference and for all the attendees to go away thinking wow they're really really great at speaking and I learned a lot from them so if we can skip this slide you all know who I am the agenda today is I'm first going to talk about how to get your message across um, then I'm going to talk about some PowerPoint slides and let me say first I'm going to go through this session just like I did in Toledo um, which had a different background a different master slide template when I get all done with this then I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about this template we put together for Southwest Fox and then um, ask or answer any questions you have about it so then the next topic will be preparing for the show, meaning how you get ready to do the presentation. And then the final section is going to be how to actually do it. So getting your message across. The first point is repetition, repetition, repetition. Ted Roach taught me this. I remember him saying that over and over again. You tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. Then you tell them what you just told them. In other words, you have your agenda slide like I just showed where I give them all the points of what I'm going to talk about. And a good key of that or a good important point of that is if they see that agenda slide and they realize it's not what they really thought, that gives them an opportunity to get up and walk out of the room and go to a different session. And you'd much rather have them do that than give you a poor rating because they didn't like it because it wasn't what they thought. So once you tell them what you're going to tell them, then of course, the meat of your session is you tell them. And then at the end of the session, you're going to wrap up with a summary, just kind of highlighting some of the points that you talked about. So it refreshes their mind of everything you just talked about. So the next thing is context. And this is really, really important. And I did not learn this until more recently, and so I'm really guilty of, of not following this. But I've got a couple examples to demonstrate. So example number one, a teacher sends an, or gives the kids in the classroom an assignment. And these are little kids. Draw a picture of your mommy or daddy at work. So all the kids do that, and then the teacher sends the pictures home with the parents with a note saying this was the assignment. Now imagine how horrified this mother was when this is what comes home. 
Now this, Doug, is where I don't like that I can't hear everybody because this is where you're supposed to all be laughing. The back story is she is not a stripper. Mom works at Home Depot. Mom works in a town where it's cold in the winter and there's snow. And there was a big snowstorm and everybody came to Home Depot looking for snow shovels, but they ran out. But mom went into the back room and she happened to find one shovel laying around that was still for sale. And when she brought it out, everybody was going after the mom wanting the shovel. So context is really, really important because like I said, you could completely jump to the wrong conclusion if you don't know the backstory behind this picture. Now, example number two is the one that really struck me um, the hardest. This is a poem, and I'm going to read you a poem. With high, and, and I want to first say, for those of you that know it, don't, well, I was going to say don't speak up, but don't say anything or chat the answer to all of this. With hacked gems making all possible, our dreamer resolutely defied all scornful laughter that tried to prevent his scheme. Your eyes deceive you, he said. An egg, not a table, correctly typifies our wondrous world. Now three sturdy sisters sought proof, forging along, sometimes through calm vastness, yet more often over turbulent peaks and valleys. Days became weeks as many doubters spread fearful rumors about the edge. At last, from nowhere, welcomed winged creatures appeared, signifying momentous success. Now, does anybody know what I was talking about? You're gonna have to type it since we have the volume turned off. Yeah, no one's typing anything. And that's exactly my point. The whole time I was reading it, your brains are trying to figure out what is she talking about? Where is she going with this? I don't get it. And that's what I was guilty of doing in sessions. I would often build up my session and keep building and showing and building and showing and building and showing to the end when I can have this really big wow moment and show them the final project. The problem was the whole time I was building and building, they didn't know where I was headed. And so they were kind of lost scratching their heads trying to figure it out. And so this example really stressed to me the importance of telling them or showing them right up front what you're talking about so they get it and to prove it. I'm going to read this poem again, only this time I'm gonna give you some context. And I want you to see how much different you react to the poem and, and you'll most likely be able to see the beauty in the poem this time. Columbus. With hacked gems making all possible, our dreamer resolutely defied all scornful laughter that tried to prevent his scheme. Your eyes deceive you, he said. An egg, not a table, correctly typifies our wondrous world. Now three sturdy sisters sought proof, forging along, sometimes through calm vastness, yet more often over turbulent peaks and valleys. Days become weeks as many doubters spread fearful rumors about the edge. At last, from nowhere, welcomed winged creatures appeared, signifying momentous success. Now, wasn't that better the second time around? You totally understood what I was talking about, and it made such a huge impact on me to change the way I do my sessions. So now I'm going to do the demo right up front and show them what our final product is of where we're headed, then back up and do the session and give them all the details of how I got there. So now that we've got the context down and, and repetition, let's talk about the PowerPoint slides. I've got a whole bunch of different ideas and suggestions. First of all, let's talk about the type of slides that you should include in your deck. You've got your title slide, which you saw on mine look like this. It has the title and it has your name. You may put your contact info in it. 
Then you have your bio slide. Now, the point of the bio slide is not to pat yourself on the back and to brag, but it's to let the attendee know you've got credentials. In other words, if they're asking themselves, why should I listen to you? Or who are you to say this? You need to have something to back them up and prove to them that what you're saying has some worth behind it. And that's what your bio slide's all about. Your agenda slide. Now, like I talked about, it's important to let them know what you're gonna talk about, that part of that repetition, repetition, repetition. I had my agenda slide with four bullet points. These are the four sections I've divided this into. So I went through right up front, letting them know what we're gonna talk about. Then you've got your transition slide. Now, you may not have noticed or paid attention, but when I switch topics, you have a, set, a slide like this, getting your message across. Every one of my, my agenda bullet points, those four, each have one of these transition slides. It's similar to you're reading a book and you turn the page and it's now chapter two. Or you're reading an article and there's a title and a subtitle and every time you get to a new section. It helps the attendee know that you're changing subjects, you're changing topics. And it lets them kind of put behind them what we just talked about so they can prepare for the next thing. I mean, I don't know, does anybody have friends or family that do this? Because I know my boyfriend is very classic of, we're having a conversation and all of a sudden he says something that I'm like trying to figure out how that related to what we we're just talking about. And I finally have to go, oh wait, you changed topics, didn't you? <laughs> so by having this transition slide, you prevent that confusion. Oh, now I just screwed up because I, I lost my train of thought here, but that's not what I wanted to do, so let me jump ahead. So after the transition slide, you have your content slide. That's what this is. This is the meat of your session. These are all the different slides you have in there. Then you're gonna have a summary slide. So at the end of this session, I'm going to have a slide that basically repeats my agenda points. I might word it differently, but it's just wrapping up each of the things that we talked about. And then I'm going to have a thank you slide. There's going to be a slide at the end. It's going to look like this that says, hey, thanks. It's going to have your name, your contact information. For this conference, we put in there to please fill out your evaluation. It's just a signal to say, okay, I'm done. And then the last kind of slide I'm gonna talk about is bonus slides, but I'm not gonna talk about them yet. I'm gonna save them for a little bit farther into the slide deck. So here are some rules. Do not write really long sentences. That, uh, this is gonna be really hard because we've got the voice turned off now, but don't write really long sentences that wrap around and around on the slide and end up looking like an entire paragraph. Number two. Do not read the slide content to the audience. I'm pretty sure your audience can read on their own and they don't need you to read to them. Rule number three, do not put all the content on the screen at once because as you're trying to talk about point number one, they're reading ahead and you've lost their attention. Now, if we had the sound on, anybody that was reading ahead would have been making noise right now and you would have got my point that you would have been interrupting me. So I'm gonna revisit this slide with better rules. So don't have long sentences. The bullet points are not supposed to be word for word everything you're gonna say. It's just supposed to be a little tickler of reminding you what you're gonna talk about. Therefore, you don't have to read the slide because it's not the whole long sentence. They can just look at it. And then use animation to expose each point. That keeps them from jumping ahead and reading ahead, which loses their focus or their attention quite a bit. So if you keep them on the bullet point you're talking about, they stay focused on you more. Some tips. Please use spell checker. It's really, really, I don't know the right word, but when I see a slide that's got a spelling error in it, I kind of cringe. I mean, a lot of cringe. I definitely cringe. 
So make sure you use spell check. Avoid page numbers. The slide masters let you put a footer at the bottom or somewhere with a page number, but I recommend you don't do that because when you have page numbers, the attendees see the numbers and they might look at it and go, oh my God, she's on number 35. How many are there? So don't let them see the number of slides you have. Avoid a busy slide. What I mean is two things, crammed pack with a lot of bullet points, but also not organized well. If it's scattered all over, and, and if you could see me, you could see I'm kind of waving my hands. Like if it's just all confusing and chaotic looking, it doesn't give you a calmness. So keep them very short, very crisp, and just clean. I said use animation, but avoid cutesy animation. I just have these bullet points popping in. If I had them bouncing in or spiraling around or any of the different options that PowerPoint has, y'all be busy by the time I was done. And it takes away from what I'm talking about because you're watching the animation. So use animation, but just simple animation. Use graphics to avoid sterile slides. Now, when I did this presentation in Toledo, the background was completely blank as far as it's just a solid blue background. background. So I used a lot more graphics. Because of this template, we have the, the picture at the bottom. I'm not using as many graphical images in my presentations because there is something in there. Um, Rick Straw, he has a background template that's got a picture of him, and I love the background because it's subtle. Um, he puts all those bullet points up, but there's something there to keep it from being sterile. So occasionally throughout your deck, throw in some graphics. Now, it may be difficult to find a graphic image that does what you want. For example, I've got this little note that says helpful tips but it doesn't match my color scheme and it's really bold and really stands out. I was just looking for something that was just kind of subtle, but it's a graphic. Well, you may not know this, but PowerPoint has a feature that lets you colorize graphics. Once I colorized it, you can see it's now there, but it's subtle. It just changed it to match up with my PowerPoint presentation. And at the end of the session, I'll show you guys how to do that. Don't put actual content at the bottom. It's okay if logos and company names and other things like that are at the bottom. But don't put content near the bottom, at least the bottom quarter, bottom 25%. The reason is in a presentation room, the people in the back, may not be able to see the entire screen, especially if you're like me and you're short and the person in front of you is tall, I might see the top of that person's head. So if important information is down at the bottom, I'm gonna miss it. So just avoid trying to use that bottom 25%. Now, of course, once in a while, you have an exception to the rule, but in general, don't put things near the bottom. The master slide should match what the projector or the screen can handle. And what I mean is, back in the day, all we had was 10 by seven as our projectors. So we didn't have the whole widescreen concept and all the PowerPoint templates were meant for more of a square look. Well, then things came along and a lot of projectors now can do the widescreens, just like our laptops are widescreens. And I've been to a lot of presentations where they're still using a square PowerPoint template on a widescreen projector, which means they're really giving up a lot of good real estate. Or I've seen the opposite where someone is using widescreen, but their projector can't handle it. It's more of the square. So what happens is their widescreen ends up squished into a tiny rectangle onto that projector screen. So if possible, when you do presentations, find out what the projector resolution is going to be. So from help, some other helpful tricks, create section breaks. So 
in my slide deck, and I'm going to jump over here to show you, I have section breaks. Each one of my um, topics from the agenda, like I have the intro, and then I have getting your message across, creating PowerPoints. By putting section breaks in there, it makes it easier. If you have to jump around to a slide, you can see they're not all just wrapped. I could actually click on one of these and it would jump to that section and I could find that slide much quicker. So creating section breaks is helpful. Another one is to show section tabs and that's what the whole left hand side of this uh, master slide does. So this guy right here, it's telling you I'm on the section called PowerPoint Slides. Earlier, it was up there on the message. And as I work through this, that is going to move down. So when I get to the next section, it'll be on preparation. That does a couple things. Number one, it kind of helps the audience follow along in your presentation. They can see how far along you are. Another thing is sometimes it can help with questions, meaning if someone has a question about preparation and they see that that's the next section, they might hold off and ask their question in the next section as opposed to asking it now when it throws off because it throws you off because you're not in that section yet. Or the flip side, someone might come into a session late and then they ask a question of, hey, well, I got a question about the message. Maybe if they see this, they'll look at it and go, uh, she's already talked about that. I'm not going to ask the question. Now, of course, there are always attendees that are going to ask anyway, so that doesn't guarantee it. But sometimes it does help with that. The other thing with this slide deck is every one of these are hyperlinked to that transition slide for the section. That's how when just a second ago I screwed up and hit the wrong button, how I was quickly able to get to where I needed to be. Because I just clicked on the section tab and got myself there. So another trick is to do dots to help you remember. And what I mean is I don't use presenter mode. I, I've always struggled with trying to use presenter mode of PowerPoint. It, it just doesn't transition well for me when I'm going back and forth between a PowerPoint and Fox Pro code and switching to other screens. So I just go raw. I'm just looking at the same screen as you guys are seeing. Sometimes, though, you get to a point where you're, you're thinking, were there three dots on this slide, or three bullet points, or four bullet points? Because it, it changes the inflection in your voice when you're trying to talk. In other words, do I need to wrap up now and pause because my next slide is going to be a next topic? Or do I have one more point to say? with this topic. So what I came up with is I use dots, and you probably never even noticed them as we're going along. And I'm going to back this up to show you. At the very bottom of my screen here, you'll see three dots. That tells me I've got three slides, or three bullet points. When I hit the first one, one of those dots disappeared. So I know I've got two more bullet points. Now I've got one more. And now I know I'm done. So every one of my slides has that. And I always do that as the last thing once I put my presentation together because it changes so much as I'm working on it. But it really helps me look at that and think, OK, am I done with this slide or not? So now that you've got your PowerPoint ready, how do you prepare for doing your presentation? So there's some things you can do ahead of time. One is clean up your desktop. It's very distracting sometimes when you see someone's desktop that has 100 different icons on it. So if possible, clean those up. Um, in the past, what I've done is create a folder, lasso them all, uh, cut them out, copy them into the folder, and I put them all away. After I'm done with all my presentations, I can bring them back. Another thing you can do, which, uh, which I have on this machine, is actually I have two different logins. One's for my main work. The other one's called presentations. It's really clean. There's very few icons. There's very little on it. It also lets me change some things like um, text size. 
Um, but in my previous job, IT locked down our laptops and would not allow us to create a new login. So I had no choice but to use the same login as the one I would, had all my daily work on. But do what you can to reduce your desktop. Create a shortcut. Now that I've told you to get rid of everything, I'm going to tell you to put some back. Any shortcuts for things you're going to need in the session, make sure you have quick access to them. Because no attendee likes to sit there and watch you open up Windows Explorer and drill through five levels of folders to go, oh, wait, that was the wrong one, and drill back up and then go to another one. So by having shortcuts so you can quickly run everything, it makes it very easy if you have to start an app up or start something up. Another thing is to create a text file with anything you're going to have to type, anything of any length. The reason is there is a demo god rule that says when you're in front of a bunch of people, you cannot type. It just happens. I type 100 words a minute, but I get up in front of a session, I can't type. So if you've got little snippets of code or little snippets of things you're going to enter or paths you need to know, create shortcuts for them or create text files for them and have a shortcut so that you can get to it very quickly and copy and paste. Another thing to do before the conference is to print out the PowerPoint slides and notes. You know, you may or may not know, but with PowerPoint, there's a place where you can enter notes to yourself that don't show up on the, the thing. And so I might, for example, in mine, my notes will tell me what form to run or what example I'm doing or what report I'm running, just what ties to this particular slide. Make sure you print those out, um, whether you print them out, put them in a binder, whatever you want to do. Make sure you have them and take them with you even if you never look at them, and I'll, I'll give an example of that later. The last one is to lock down your machine. And what I mean is, at least a week before, two if you can pull it off, no more Windows updates, no more updating software, don't install something new, because it just might bite you. You'll have everything practiced, everything rehearsed, everything's great, and then you go to the conference and you stand up in the room and you start to do your demo and it crashes. And you're like, great, it worked last week. Well, did you do a Windows update? Did you do something? Um, if at all possible, lock down your machine, don't do anything. Practice, I can't stress this one enough. Practicing really, really does help. So get it all done and actually sit down and go through your whole session. And do it out loud. There's a big difference between sitting at your desk and just mentally going through all your slides and mentally saying what it is you're going to say. It's very different when you say it out loud. Um, you know, in your mind, everything's perfect. Everything flows beautifully. You say it out loud, sometimes you sound like a bumbling idiot. So if you practice out loud, you'll see where there's things that just don't flow right. If possible, practice in front of real people. I have to say that's one thing I really miss since I've moved to North Carolina, because when I was in Michigan, there were multiple user groups. So I could always go practice in front of real people and get real feedback. It's it's a huge help when you're doing this session because, which, which I can't do right now because I can't see you guys, but when you see the looks on their faces, you can sometimes see when they're confused or based on their questions, you might go back later and go, wow, it must be I was not very clear on that point. How can I refactor that to be more clear? So in front of real people makes a huge difference. And if you don't have the opportunity to do real people, reach out to someone and do like a web presentation like what we're doing here. I know when I actually put this together for Toledo, I reached out to Jody and we did a little quick demo and I walked through the whole session with that with her and she gave me a lot of good feedback on how to improve it. So there's always a way to do quote real people because 
the dog just doesn't count. They don't really give you good feedback. Also, practice with your actual equipment. And what I mean is, at home, when I'm working, I have my laptop and two external monitors, so I've got three screens. I've got an external keyboard laid out. I've got this great little setup. If you just practice with that setup, you may be a little confused or off when you're standing in South, at Southwest Fox and all you have is your laptop, the keyboard on the laptop instead of a real one. Maybe you have a different mouse. Everything's going to be different. So when you practice, use that mouse, use that keyboard. If you have an external one you're going to take, great. But if you're planning to use just the laptop and that keyboard, that's what you should practice with. And then lastly, if possible, record it when you practice it and then go back and watch it. It can be very, very brutal to watch yourself do a presentation. Um, I remember Doug at one point saying he watched one of his and he saw throughout the whole session, he kept using his finger to push his glasses up the bridge of his nose over and over and over again had not realized he was doing that. So when you watch it, like I said, it'll be brutal and you're gonna cringe, but it will help you become a better speaker. So last minute thing. So this is just before it's your turn to go up and speak. Make sure you have your screen in the appropriate resolution. Um, you know, I talked a bit about the slide deck being widescreen in the right resolution. Especially if you're going to be showing code, you know, like I said, I've got my, my three monitors and everything's big at home. And so I can use, you know, the 19 whatever by something resolution and I can see it. But when you're in a presentation and it's up on the screen, that's really hard for the attendees to read. So bump it, bump your resolution so things are bigger on the screen. Um, you're going to lose real estate, but make sure, and let me back up and say, make sure you do that when you practice as well. So when everything is set, you've got all the same resolution that you plan to use in the conference. Open any net apps you're gonna need. You know, if you're gonna use Fox Pro, open Fox Pro. If you need to use Excel or Word or any other tool, um, Chrome, Internet Explorer, whatever, open them and minimize them. The reason is some of them take a minute to open. You don't need to be clicking the button to open it and then stalling for 60 seconds while we all wait for it to open. For example, Visual Studio might take forever. So open all those apps and make sure the resolution and the font size is readable. And by font size, for example, all your code examples. When you bring up a method or a program and you're looking at code, make sure the font size is bumped up bigger so that the attendees can see it. And lastly, turn off any of the pop-ups and toasters you might have. Close Facebook, Twitter, Skype, Outlook, email, any of that kind of stuff, turn it off. And I have a really funny story about that. When I worked at Microsoft, we were in a team meeting. So there was maybe 15 of us in the room and one particular person was doing a presentation and a friend of theirs, who happens to be someone that many of us all knew, popped up on, I don't know what it was, link, Skype, whatever, but popped up on his little toaster thing with a message. And what it said was, dude, my girlfriend's pregnant. So imagine, how that went over when he thought he was telling one private person that his girlfriend was pregnant and in reality, 15 of us now know his girlfriend was pregnant. So turn all that off so you avoid any embarrassing situations. This tip um, is about how you run PowerPoint. Show the presentation. What I mean is you don't open up PowerPoint, open up your presentation, and then hit the F5 key to run it. 
And what I want to explain here is if I'm at Alt-Tab and you see all the things I have open, typically, if you were not doing what I did, you would have two PowerPoints in there. You'd have one that's the slide deck, but then you'd have another one which, if you hit it, takes you to edit it. And inevitably, inevitably when you're going back and forth with Alt-Tab, you hit the wrong one. And then you end up in edit mode, and then you have to flip back to the other one. So there's two ways you can show the presentation without actually running PowerPoint in edit mode. One is I have a shortcut on my desktop, but instead of double clicking it, so the shortcut points to this um, PPT file, the PowerPoint file. Instead of double clicking it, you right click, scroll down, and there'll be an option that says show. When you hit that, it's gonna run it in show mode, which I have right now. Another option is to put a desktop icon on there. This icon will always, always, always run in show mode, when, even when you just double click it. And the way you do that is you change the target. So over here, the target is the full path to PowerPoint, so it's PowerPoint.exe, then, I use the slash S option, and then I put the full path to my PowerPoint slide. So the slash S tells it, run PowerPoint, and then show this particular presentation. So either one of those, whatever is your preference, they work and let you show it without having the PowerPoint in edit mode. So stepping on stage. It's your turn, the butterflies are there, you're about to go up. Bring some water. It's really important, water, Mountain Dew, vodka, I don't really care. Just bring something to drink. Silence your cell phone. It's annoying when an attendee's phone goes off, but make sure you, your phone doesn't go off either. Empty your pocket. The reason I say this, maybe you've got change, you've got keys, whatever, a knife, gadgets, anything in your pocket. Empty them out and put them on the table. The reason is when people get nervous, they tend to fidget. And if you have something in your pockets, you might fidget with it. So by removing it, you're kind of taking away that distraction. Also, take off your name tag. Again, it's a distraction. You might fiddle with it. It's, it's there right in front of you. And so your hands might go to it. You might just start fiddling or it might get in your way or you knock it. So just take it off and set it on the table next to you. Take off your watch. If you wear a watch, some people don't anymore, but if you wear a watch, take it off. You can set it on the table where you can see it, but here's why I say take it off. If you're partway through the session and in your mind you're thinking, I wonder how many minutes I have left, you lift up your arm, tilt it, and you read your watch. As soon as you do that, the people in the audience also go, yeah, I wonder what time it is. And then they look at their watch or their cell phone, and you've just lost their attention span for a second. And that's something you don't want to do when you're doing a presentation. You always want to keep their attention. Set out the printed slides and notes. I told you to print them, set them out. I actually have them, they're printed, they're setting out next to me on the table. And I also actually fan them out, so it's not like a stack of crisp paper. And the corners, I kind of bend up a bit. In other words, I'm wrinkling it a bit so that I can easily grab it and turn the page if I need to, instead of stopping and trying to lick my finger and grab it and pull it apart because it's a fresh set that just came off the printer. So just set them there. You may never look at them, but trust me, you want them there. Also, set out a paper and pen. I always have a pad of paper and a pen, and I do a couple things with it, but one is if someone asks me a question and I don't know, I might want to write myself a note to research it. Um, or maybe someone has a comment about 
where they say that they've got an idea, something I hadn't thought of. I think, wow, that's a cool idea. Oh, I'm going to write that one down. Um, always have that paper in case you need to write something. And I also, I write down the ending time of the session at the top of that pad of paper. The reason is you're always looking at the time. You're always wondering how much time do I have left? You don't want to have to do the math in your head of, okay, I started at 2 o'clock, so I'm going to go to, what, 3.15, 3.30. You just, your nerves are there. When you're speaking, you don't want to have to do math. So just write down the ending time so at any given moment you can look at that and know how close you are um, when you see a clock or a watch. Put the mic on. Um, of course, Doug, that does not apply. He does not need a mic. For people like me, I need a mic. Put it on, tap it, test it, make, ask the people in the back of the room if they can hear. Just make sure it's all working before you're ready to start. So now, you're all prepared, everything's ready, it's time to go. Um, one of the things I do is I ask, it's kind of a transition to say, okay, I'm ready to start, because a lot of times you're chatting with people ahead of time. So I ask people, someone in the back, can you close the door and we'll get started. So now I'm ready. I want you to know about a couple tools that are really helpful for doing the presentation. One is Zoom It. And you saw me use it when I was doing the zooming in over to the corner of the dot. You can move in, move around. You can also draw on it. It has a feature to draw with or without the zoom. It's great for highlighting stuff. So if I want to say here was this or I want to point, it's a whole lot better than just wiggling your mouse saying, and over here, um, you can get it from there. It's customizable. You can change, like I changed the hotkeys that it uses to trigger it, um, but really simple tool. Another tool is Flick Run. You may not notice that I even have it up there. It is, if I zoom in down to the bottom, well, when I zoom, you can see it. Let me highlight it. It's this guy down here. You can see very faintly, it says 2.46 p.m. I do that. What, what Slick Run is, is a tool that helps you launch other apps. I use it in my everyday work. Um, Rick Straw is the one that pointed me to it years ago, and I love it. I have very few icons on my normal desktop. If I want to run Fox Pro, I click in it. I type F. It brought up Fox because it knows it. it um, so it's type ahead so it knows Fox Pro was the last one that I did. If I were to hit enter there, it would go ahead and launch Fox Pro. If I type W in there, it's going to launch Word. Um, when I start work in the morning, I type M for morning, and it launches my email. It launches Fox Pro. It, I can tell it to launch all kinds of different apps all at once. It's a really cool tool. So for presentations, it's great if you do need to quickly launch something, you can type a little thing in there. It's great because I can subtly have the time on the screen so that I can look down and see it, but it's not so bold because you can change the colors. So I always change the colors of it to blend in with the background of the slides so it's not very obvious. Um, another thing you can do with it is besides launching apps, you could launch um, Explore and give it a certain path, and it'll go to a certain directory. So you can set up things if you need to show things in a directory, a quick little, they call it Word, just set up a quick Word to jump you to that particular directory. So very helpful when doing a presentation. Um, I'm not asking you for questions right now. I'm talking about questions. It's kind of hard to do a presentation on presentations. Plan for questions. This is like the most dreaded thing, one of the most dreaded things for a presenter is questions, how to handle them. But you have to plan for them. And by planning, I mean you have to allow time. Um, if you practice your sessions at home and you say, okay, I got a 75-minute slot, I came in at 70 minutes. Wow, I'm really good. Nope. 
Because when you do the presentation live, people are going to ask questions, and that's going to cut into your time. So you have to know there's going to be questions that come up. Something that I do, which is not working right now because you guys aren't asking questions, whenever someone asks a question in, a, in a, one of my presentations, you'll notice I reach over and I pick up my glass and I take a drink. The reason is, if I just stop and take a drink, there's a pause in the conversation. And that pause is a chance to lose their focus and their attention. So when someone else asks a question, that's my opportunity to quick take a drink because there's not a lull in the conversation. The conversation is still going on. So go ahead, take a drink. Repeat the question. This one's really important. In that presentation room, if someone near the front of the room asks a question and then you just start answering it, guaranteed a whole bunch of people in the back of the room, they couldn't hear the question. So you start answering and they have no idea what you're talking about, kind of back to that context example. They have no idea what you're saying or why. So if you repeat the question, now everybody knows the question and they can benefit from the answer. Also, it helps confirm that you understood the question because you don't necessarily have to repeat it verbatim, but if you paraphrase it, the person who asked the question maybe may jump in and go, no, no, that's not what I meant. And it stops you from answering the wrong question. If you don't know the answer, please admit that you don't know the answer. Do not make up an answer, because that's one of the biggest ways to lose your credibility, is if they feel like you're just winging it and you, you really don't know what you're talking about, um, they're not gonna be as prone to pay attention to the rest of what you have to say. Um, typically, a lot of times what I'll do is say, wow, that's a good question, I don't really know the answer. How about you send me an email after this session reminding me of the question, and I'll do some research and see if I can figure out the answer for you. Or sometimes I might go, huh, I don't know, but I wonder if maybe Tamar might know the answer to that. She's kind of more familiar with that. Do you know who Tamar is? If not, let me, after the session, I'll see if I can help you find her and we can ask her. So you're not shoving the attendee off, you're helping them. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's try to figure out an answer in some way. And plus, by offering to take them over to Tamar and ask the question, they may not feel as intimidated about just walking up to someone and asking the question. And then lastly, it, it's going to happen. There are going to be people that are going to ask off-topic questions. There's going to be the know-it-alls that have to share. Um, there's going to be the overshares that have to tell you everything that they did all the time. And there's going to be your hecklers. Usually it's us other speakers. But you have to know ahead of time how you are going to handle these. Kind of come up with some phrases that you can use when one of these things happen. So, for example, when people ask me an off-topic question, I might say something like, that's a really good topic or really good question. It's a little bit off topic and I've got a lot of material to cover here. So let me keep going with the session. But afterwards, why don't you meet me out in the hallway and I'd be happy to talk about it. So I'm not blowing them off per se, but I'm keeping focus because it's my session and I have an obligation to the attendees to get through my material and give them everything they came for. They did not come here to hear about the overshare or the know-it-all. They came about the topic that you're presenting. So make sure you maintain control of your session by shutting down anything that can suck the time away. So when things go wrong, I am so glad I'm not this guy because that really looks like it hurts. It's going to happen at some point in your career of presenting. Something's going to go horribly wrong. Try to avoid that awkward silence. 
uh, yeah, you're doing a presentation, your demo doesn't run, something doesn't go as planned, don't just go, go quiet while you try to figure it out. You always have to keep talking and keep their attention. Also, don't waste a lot of time trying to resolve it. I've seen a lot of sessions where someone might go through and they, they're trying to debug the code and 10 minutes later, we're still trying to figure out why this demo doesn't work. It's okay to spend a little bit of time if it's something simple, oh yeah, okay, I see I have a typo here, or well, I forgot to change this between sessions and that's why it's not working. But don't spend a lot of time because that time is precious for the rest of your session. So if you can't resolve it, apologize once and move on. And when I say apologize once, I mean once. Don't apologize that it didn't work and then 10 minutes later in your session go, yeah, if I would have been able to show you that uh, demo, and then later, so that demo that I was going to show you, every time you say something like that, what it does is remind them that something didn't work right. So don't keep bringing the point up. Just apologize. Um, you could even say, oh, I'll see if I can figure it out and I'll maybe put a, um, an update in my white paper about what was wrong and how I had to fix it but just move on. So have a backup plan because things do go wrong. Make sure you have everything backed up on like a thumb drive or the cloud or both. And when I say everything, your PowerPoint slides, um, any demos, any of the uh, applications, uh, Fox Pro. You can put Fox Pro on a thumb drive. You can actually run it from a thumb drive. Put everything on multiple backups so that if something goes wrong, um, I know there's been people where their machine crashes at a conference. Now they're scrambling. They have to borrow someone else's machine, put their presentation on, and go ahead and run with it. Have spare batteries for your mouse. Um, you don't want to be up there talking away and then all of a sudden you lose your mouse. So if you want to always put a fresh battery in, that's fine. But I always have batteries in my uh, backpack for my laptop. So if, like right now, I actually have um, not only my mouse, but my uh, little clicker presenter tool. I have batteries for both of those, just in case. Have screenshots, you know, like the old Julia Child, put it in one oven, pop the cook dish out the other oven. Screenshots of any demos you want to run, screenshots of any websites you might go to, just in case the internet's down, the app doesn't run. Um, if you at least have screenshots stored somewhere that you can quickly pop up, it gives you the ability to at least talk about it. You can bring it up on the screen. Of course, you can't run the app, but you can at least talk about it and show them some things. Um, it, and I want to back up because a perfect example, well, it's actually this one, a perfect example of the printed slides again. You know, I've said that a couple times. you got to have the slides, and I'm going to tell you why. Here's why. I saw a session years ago, Roxanne Cyber. She's doing her presentation. Everything's going beautifully. About an hour into the session, her laptop, laptop starts flashing saying, uh, low battery, low battery, low battery. She's scrambling. She's looking at the back of her computer. Yeah, she's like, I'm, I'm plugged in. They go over to the wall outlet. It's plugged in. They move it to another outlet. Still, it's flashing, it's flashing. Bam, shuts down. Oh, crap, now what? She had her printed slides. And she grabbed those slides and finished the last 15 minutes of her session with no computer whatsoever. She was able to look at those, see her notes, and even though she couldn't show us, she still talked about it and winged it so well that it was like, wow, I'm going to give you like 10 stars just for pulling that off. She really did a great job. 
So by having those printed slides, you hope you never need them. But if you do, they're there. So multiple monitor setups. This happens all the time. You know, like I said, at home, I've got the laptop plus two external monitors. Normally, Fox Pro is running on my middle monitor. So that's great. So you go to do a presentation. And let's like jump over here to Fox Pro. I've got my presentation up. We're talking about something. And I want to bring the debugger up. Ah, crap. Where's the debugger? It's over here on monitor two. And you guys can't see it. You see if I hover there, it's there. But clicking it doesn't show it. So what do you do? Well, here's what you do. And it's not very intuitive. First, you hover over the taskbar icon. Then you right click the title bar. Then you select move from the context menu. Then you gotta press a little arrow key once. Now you can use your mouse to finish the move. Real intuitive, right? Here's what I mean. I'm gonna hover over here. Now I can go up here, right on the title bar, right click, click move use my arrow key, and as soon as I hit my arrow key, it put control into my mouse, and now I can bring it back. Practice that one, because there are certain tools that don't honor that um, not recognizing when you switch between multiple monitors to a single monitor, and I've been bit by the debugger, I've been bit by uh, pen editor does it to me, um, there's a couple others, so just make sure you practice. So wrapping up, and I, I'm not wrapping up this session now, I'm talking about wrapping up, but you summarize what you told them. That's where I was saying in the beginning, repetition, repetition, repetition. So I'm just gonna have a summary slide and I'm gonna go through the bullet points of my agenda and just a quick little recap. I'm gonna show them my contact info. If there's time left, I'm gonna ask for questions. If not, I'm gonna tell them, hey, running out of time, but I will be available after the session out in the hallway if anybody's got some questions. And I'm also available around the conference. Please walk up to me anytime, um, except when I'm giving a session, but approach me and ask whatever questions. I'm here for you. So make sure you tell them that. So it gives them permission to do so. Time management. I don't know what is worse. Questions from audience members or trying to manage the time and finishing your session on time. Both of those are like big, big fears of me personally speaking. First of all, practice. The more you practice, the more you'll get it down and the more you'll start to understand how much time and where you should be throughout the presentation. Mark the time on the printed slides. You know, I've talked about printing them, but every so often on the slides, I mark down, okay, well, I started at 2 o'clock, so at 2.15, I should be here on this slide. I write 2.15. And somewhere else, I might write 2.30 on another one. So it's very specific to the session slot that I'm in. So since we repeat them, I usually have two sets of times on my slides. But I just mark it down because then as you're going through, if you glance over and you realize, ooh, I should be a lot farther along, you'll know to pick up the pace. Or if you find out you're cruising along way too fast, you can slow down the pace. It just gives you an opportunity to gauge how you're doing. So when you run out of time, I've been in a lot of sessions where I've seen this. Speakers. Maybe there were a lot of questions. There's a whole bunch of reasons why they could be running out of time. All of a sudden, they realize, crap, I've only got five minutes. And you see them click, 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 click through 10 slides. They jump ahead going, yeah, okay, I don't have time for that. I don't have time. Dun, 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 dun. And boom. When they did that, the attendee, in a way, feels cheated. Wow, there's a lot of stuff I didn't get to see. 
So instead, what you do is in your slide deck, which this master slide has, there is a little secret hidden shortcut that goes straight to my summary slide. So if I'm talking along and all of a sudden I realize I'm running out of time, all I have to do is these little Copa Kelly guys down here, I can talk about a slide, I realize I'm running out of time, I click, so in summary, and boom, you jump right on with the end of your session. They have no idea you just skipped over 10 slides. What you can also do is in summary, you can tell them, and then you can just kind of throw in, yeah, in my white paper, it's got a lot more stuff, so be sure to read that. But until they go back and look at your slide deck, if they ever do, they would never know that you skipped over content and so they never have that feeling of being cheated. Now, the opposite is when you run out of time or you end too soon. I mean, it's okay to stop 10 minutes early. You've got a lot of time for questions, but you don't want to end 30 minutes early. That's way too early. So here's what you do. Bonus slides. I mentioned this very early on and said I would talk about it later, and that's what I'm doing. What you do is when you put your session together, some of the content that maybe isn't quite as important or quite pertinent, you move it to the end of your slide deck. So if you have time, you can go ahead and jump and show those bonus slides. So for me, let's say I finished my session, my thank you slide comes up, and then boom, right after that, if I realize I'm out of time, I can go on to the next one that says, hey, I've got some, some bonus stuff. We've got a little bit of time. Let's talk about it. And I can click and I can show that particular slide and I can talk about it. And if I still have more time, I can click again and I can talk about enough. And I basically go through as many slides as I have time. But when I'm done, on this particular slide, the bonus one, the Copa Kelly, is going to jump to a second thank you slide. So when I'm all done, it just jumps over there and it, it, they just, all they see is you went to bonus, I did a couple bonus things, and thank you. They're like, wow, now they're coming away feeling like, oh, cool, I got some bonus info. So those are two little tricks that I like to use, and, and I can show you later how some of this works um, when I'm done with this session. So be kind to the next speaker. Don't go over your time slot. We just talked about time management, but that's one of the big ones. Um, that, that 15 minutes between sessions, that next speaker wants that time to get set up, to get mentally prepared, to get into their zone. And if you're talking over and over and over and over, it's cutting into their time. That's not fair. So when you're done, take the mic off. Again, there's stories going around of certain people who may have forgotten to take their mic off and then went to the restroom. So we all knew that they went to the restroom. So make sure you take that mic off right away. Get off the stage. And what I mean by this is, for example, you do your presentation, you wrap up, have your thank you slide. It's real common for a handful of attendees to come up to the front and ask you questions. If you're still standing there answering the questions, even though you didn't go over your time slot, you're still in the way of the next speaker. So what I like to do, for example, you'll, if, when you see me speak, you'll see I've got my little presentation stand to get the laptop the height I want. When I'm done, I grab that stand and I move it over to the other end of the table. I basically slide all my crap out of the way so that the next speaker can come in and start setting up. And then I immediately start tearing it down and throwing it into my laptop bag even while people are asking me questions, I still kind of keep giving them my top contact and I answer, but I'm continuing to get out of the way so that I can move this whole 
group of people out of the way of the next speaker. Also, before you leave, ask them, can I get you some water? Can I get you something to drink? Is there anything else you need? Especially if it's a newbie speaker, we all want to be good mentors and stay for a minute, make sure the projector hooks up okay, make sure they're okay with the mic, anything that they need, just, just help them out and ask. Um, just, I just really know that was really good for me in the beginning because um, I was always very nervous. So just whatever you can do to help it flow for the next speaker. So, now this one really is the real summary. So what did we talk about? Well, we talked about how to get your point across. We talked about repetition, repetition, repetition. Uh, we talked about context, how important it is to um, go ahead and tell them the big picture up front instead of building up to it. We talked about the PowerPoint slides. We talked about like the different slide types of slides. Um, we talked about different tips like not having really busy slides. Um, we talked about using animation. We talked about graphics, some of those different things. We talked about the little dots at the bottom corner, all kinds of little mini things for your slides. We talked about preparing, you know, we talked about practice, practice, practice. We talked about getting your desktop cleaned up. Um, some of the last minute things you can do, like the resolution. We talked about using the show feature as opposed to opening PowerPoint and then running it. And then lastly, we talked about execution, um, how to actually pull it off looking like a pro, which we're all faking for the most part, but some of us fake it better than others. So make sure, for example, you handle when things go wrong, that you have backup plans, that you use some of the utilities like um, Flick Run for the time or Zoom it to zoom in on things. Um, and then those time management tips of jumping around between like a bonus section or a bonus slide versus jumping straight to the summary when you run out of time. So, that's it. Doug, you can go ahead and turn the um, sound back on and then we can do some questions and we can talk about the actual um, PowerPoint mat, uh, background master slide. Okay, um, I might as well stop the recording too. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so let's just do that. Oops. One. <laughs> Um, it's, like I said in the beginning, it's all about paying it forward and sharing all the things I've learned from other people. So many people have taught me so many different things over the years, and that's why I wanted to do this. It's just any if anybody just took away 